who's probably one of our early members. He was a regular attendee on rail tours, outings, and as well as the famous library nights up in the IRS HQ in Drumcondra and then in later years at Euston Station. Now, I got to know Tom about 10 years ago, particularly at the Society's Christmas party where we, sometimes I bring a laptop and I bring some pictures that I've digitized from the collection and I'd actually just have it running during the evening during the Christmas party and on the first time I met Tom he saw some of these images and he was sitting down at the table with a group of other members and they're just commenting and reminiscing about the the scenes that were coming up on the screen and that's I just got chatting to Tom then and he was a very uh, perfect gentleman in, in every way he was very kind he was very modest about his own photography and what films he shot he would often comment about the fact that they were actually up in an attic and that at some point he would go up to the attic and, and get them but unfortunately that that quite never quite happened but he still attended the meetings and he was a regular person to see many people will know him as well from the outings that visited the abandoned railways he would often bring black and white pictures uh, to show some of the locations as, a, as that they used to look as he photographed it back in the 1950s 60s and 70s he was fortunate in about taking his pictures around 19, late 1950s, 1959, I say it was probably his earliest picture, and he was able to see the last glimpse of CIE steam and then, of course, steam on the Great Northern System and then further up north. But he did record that important transition between between the modern, between the, the old steam age to the modern kind of CIE traction that many of us of my generation would be particularly familiar with. He worked in the Royal College of Surgeons. Now, that's the building that you're seeing on screen. That's Tom actually on one of those trips, uh, on those abandoned line trips to the Burma Road. But that's the Royal College of Surgeons where Tom worked for 40 years. He worked in the processing labs, uh, in, in particularly in the photographic uh, processing labs in the laboratories in the college. And I actually have some clips showing Tom actually at work in in the lab so that's tom there working away in the lab and you'll see some of his colleagues as well so he did have a good technical knowledge particularly about um developing negatives and slides and other things through through his work and that's just again one of him again but so these would have been shot around mid 1960s or late 1960s and that's one of the interesting things about about these films is that he was taking still pictures and film footage at the same time. And you'll see some examples. That's one of his pictures there. That's um, 85 Merlin, just north of Hope Junction and just south of Baldoil with a Dublin-bound train coming from Belfast. Of course, that's uh, preserved in number 85 Merlin by the RPSI. Of course, taken in CIE days, you can see the CIE stencil on the buffers. And um, another picture Again, this was one of the favorite ones that I came across in Tom's collection. Uh, U-Class 440, number 199, Loch Derg, approaching Claude Road at Drumcondra, hauling a mixed set of wagons, a gas tank, and it looks like a, an AEC rail car, power car, in the orange and black livery, and a four-wheel heating van. And I can only suspect this was a transfer working uh, coming round from the Boston sidings at Western Row, heading towards Houston. This is just an example of then one of the diesel era pictures. He looked that's on the main line at Salons. That train is out there in what is the, the loop at the north end of Salons and has been overtaken by an up express from Cork. And that's Salons North Signal Cabin on the left. And then this is just a freight working near the border area at Mount Pleasant, north of Dundalk, a bulk cement train from Grosvenor Road in Belfast, heading to the cement depot at Cabra, again, taken in the late 1960s. Unfortunately, um, Tom's health started to fail uh, towards, the, towards the last five or six, seven years, and he was found it difficult to get down to the premises at Euston Station, the IRS one, and he stopped attending meetings. It was just too difficult for him, but myself and fellow member and friend Colin O'Callaghan would visit him at the nursing home actually in Clondalkin, which was just a few miles just north of where he lived in Watkinstown. And we were able to actually bring 
some of the journals and some of the cine films that I presented from other film shows, and he was delighted to see these. Um, fortunately, though, Tom passed away then in November 2019, for courtesy of Tom's family, and in particular uh, his nephew, Austin, they donated his photographic collection and cine collection to the society. And that was during last summer. So during the summer months and on, I've been digitizing his pictures and his cine films and restoring them. And this is the method I use for digitizing Tom's films, which are of the eight millimeter variety, standard eight. The method I use, of course, I have to project them on the screen, but I want you probably just to take note of the quality as they come out of the projector. And I'll show you how it looks when digitized in a second. And you'll see the restoration will be, we show you the colors, the cleanup job that I do on them. One of the things I do when working through the films is making a catalog of all the different scenes that are recorded on the films and of course this informs me of being able to put the films together and know which ones to digitize and know which ones to edit and subsequently uh, put together later because a lot of these films come from about 10 or 20 films that I've joined and edited together so they wouldn't have all just come out exactly as you see them tonight. This is the, as some of you may have seen this at the previous film show, this is the cine digitizer that I use for the 8mm films. It takes a, a frame by frame scan as the film passes through the scanner. But what I didn't explain last time was that it can do uh, it more, the bigger sizes than just the small three inch reels that you see here. It can do up to four and five inch, but the five inches don't quite fit onto the machine. So a method that I got around this particular problem was that I used an old um, kind of uh, brackets here. For, for the actual cine film for editing for splicing films that came from the late Tony Price. And I simply placed the machine on top of this bracket. And as you can see, the larger reel has actually been fed through the machine. That's a three inch reel being fed through it. And that's now a larger four inch one that's being fed through it. So you can see it's going from one side of the machine to the other. And it's taking a scan frame by frame. As you can imagine, it can take a long time to do this particular work. So about four or five minutes of footage might take about half an hour. You can see the frame. That's how small they are in eight millimeter. And I have it hooked up. The machine is hooked up to a screen, uh, just an ordinary television screen. And I can actually then get a visual representation of what the actual film is coming out at. Then I import the films onto the computer and I carry out some restoration work. This is literally just taken on my own video camera of a screen, so apologies if the quality isn't that particularly great. But that just shows you the left-hand side is unedited. The right-hand side, you can see I've been brightening up the shot to get a bit more detail. Then I run the films through a stabilizer. So you can see the left-hand side is quite shaky, but the right-hand side is quite smooth. So again, I'm stabilizing the footage because eight millimeter material isn't like digital, it's not perfectly sharp. And then I carry out them sort of from some further adjustments in the color restoration and contrast. And if you remember that particular shot I showed you, this is on the yaw branch that comes the hopefully when it's fully restored. This is how it looks. So things are a bit smoother. The colors are much better. The exposure is properly restored, although it's still a little bit speckly. That's actually one thing with Tom's films, that they were a little bit dirty. They hadn't been used or shown, I imagine, in many years. And then this is the video editing program I use. It's called Pinnacle Studio. And you can see here all the individual clips I've imported into the editor. And I start to kind of put them together. So you can see there's an enormous amount of kind of work involved in actually piecing these films together. So, but it's very satisfying and rewarding when you see it all finished and we're able to present the films as you see them here tonight. They also go through a final part of the restoration where the colors are restored. And then I label the films and pack them away. And that kind of that's, that's the kind of process that's involved. I know it's quite technical, but I know people have asked me many questions since I started doing these shows, just how does the 8 millimeter material, how it's digitized. So I hope that might explain some of the process and the work involved. 
Um, I just regret that Tom isn't around here to see the films, but I'm sure what you're going to see tonight now will be really enjoyable. The running order, by the way, for tonight is I'll be showing films of Tom's taken mainly around the Dublin area, heading out the Great Southern and Western Main Line and the Great Northern Main Line. And the second film is actually a film by Joe St. Ledger. So I can't quite cover all of Tom's films tonight because they're still in the editing stage. So I have another film with Joe St. Ledger's on the Yall branch. And then the second part will return to Tom's films for a visit along the Midland Great Western Line and the Dublin Southeastern Main Line before ending the night uh, with some images along the North Kerry Line. And I've written just some notes. I've done some research on some of this material. I don't have exact dates for the particular workings or particular or detail of some of the trains, but I think what Tom showed, sort of the pictures sort of explain themselves to some extent. And our opening shot is of an AEC railcar set arriving into Amiens Street Station in Dublin in mixed livery, CIE, black and orange, as well as green. And now we have a shot of Amiens Street Shed with B121 class, engine B135, sharing the scene with X Great Northern, VS class locomotive, number 207 Boyne. And as some people may have seen with the clips I uploaded of Tom's to the IRS YouTube channel. In this shot, you can see B124 being turned on the turntable at Amiens Street with the vacuum hose on the locomotive um, attached to the power mechanism on the turntable. And now we see B124 heading north out of the station with a train for Belfast made up of UTA stock in the Brunswick Green livery. Plus there's a CIE heating van, as you can see, towards the rear of the train. And now we have another mixed AEC rail car set, which is followed by this C-class engine hauling a Maybach diesel shunter, a gas tank wagon, a four-wheel heating van, which is en route probably to the Boston sidings at Westland Row. And we have A15 in black and orange livery. And now we have a VS class number 207 Boyne approaching Amiens Street, which what I think is a rugby special from Belfast. I think this was probably around April 19, April 1965. You'll see it works into the present day platform five at Connolly Station nowadays. So that's Amy Street, the signal cabin, the Great Northern signal cabin at the north end of the station. Here we see 207 approaching the CIE platforms with the rugby special from Belfast. and running round at the south end of the station. What's more elegant, the, the E-Class? Shunter or number 207. I think it's an easy winner. That's 207. And so heading off to the turntable at Amien Street.
It may have been the 10th of April 1965. There were other rugby specials during that year, um, in January and February, but they were worked by Diesel south of Dundalk. Whereas, of course, number 207 was worked all the way from Belfast. So it's one of those dirty, necessary jobs. And of course, this was increasingly becoming a rare sight at Amiens Street, because virtually all of the workings from the Dublin end were diesel hauled. So we're going to head up the main line now, and you can see, well, a, an A-Class making an impersonation of a steam train with the, the old Crossley diesel engine. And this is just north of Colester at a place called Venetian Hall and then a southbound work into Dublin again at Harmonstown and now we're out at Port Marnock southbound GNR BUT set in the CIE black and orange livery and heading the opposite way towards Belfast again number 207 And this is a rather rural looking Hope Junction, southbound train from Belfast behind a 121 class. And then we'll see a branch train coming off from the Hope direction. I think it's an A class with three carriages. Some of Tom's films is a little bit distorted and um, there's some damage to some of them, but I hope these scenes are interesting in their own right, that their word is being shown. And now we have a WT class tank engine heading past Clontarf, or the depot at Fairview actually. So this is where Clontarf Road Station is nowadays sited. And this is what I think is the tourist train, um, a, a train that ran in the summer months. Uh, that was usually steam hauled between Dublin and Belfast. And here the train is seen again, this time passing Colester. And you'll see Colester signal cabin on the left. That had closed in October 1960, so you can see it's all boarded up. And this is at the top of the bank, Rush Bank, near Scaries. UTA. Uh, rail cars, X Great Northern BUT and AE e set. Number 207 again. And this is Russian Lusk Station. And we know that that's B127, one of the gray and yellow 121 class engines that had a red buffer beam. And this is Scary Station itself. I'm not too sure, it might have been a failure, but we have two A-classes coming out of the sidings at the north end of Scaries. And you'll get an idea just of the sort of mixed goods workings that you had in the 1960s. A horse box, some H-vans, cement bubbles, a caravan, which I think, if I'm right, may have been come from Dundalk Engineering Works. And you'll see that that shot had some ex-Great Northern brake vans. This is Gormanston Station southbound goes working before we move across 
to the Navin branch. Gormanson Signal Cabin, as it happens, that closed in 1993, but the wooden part of the structure still exists at the Cavan and Leitrim Railway. That's the former station at Bow Park, and this is Navin itself. I suspect this may have been uh, a GAA special, because, of course, the Navin branch had lost its regular passenger services in 1958. And it's one of the last remaining Great Northern signal cabins still in use in Avon. We're back now at Amiens Street Station. And again, I think that's one of the tourist train workings uh, arriving in from the Belfast direction. And this is just north of Baldoyle where Clong Griffin Station is nowadays sited. And we see the same engine I think is probably um, number 54 and we're going to move across now to the Great Southern and Western Main Line and this is Glasnevin Junction and we see two passenger workings with GM diesels one heading towards Amy Street the other one heading towards Island Bridge And that's Glasnevin Cemetery off just to the left hand side. And this is Kingsbridge Station or Euston Station. And we see Soldier Engine B107. I think it may have been a pilot engine, but definitely the next shot shows um, a pilot engine in the form of an A class and um, still in the green livery. And also another kind of pilot engine would have been an E-Class, Maybach E-Class. And now we're out at the Gullet, and this is a down evening train hauled by 121 class in the grey and yellow livery. And this is out at Clondalk, and so this would have been Tom's local station. And we see a southbound working. Very rural looking scene, complete contrast to today, today, which is all more or less built up and quite industrial. That's an up train from Cork passing through Clondalkin station. Of course, there's no trace of this station left nowadays. one of the Great Southern and Western Railway station buildings dating from the opening of the line in the 1840s. And this is Stack Omni Bridge, north of Hazel Hatch and up working to Dublin. And that's a southbound working, again at Stack Omni. Milepost eight and three quarters, a well-known spot for photographers. We're still at Stack Omni, and this is a southbound cement working, A43. And you'll see, of course, back in the 1960s, they still had uh, brake fans at the front and rear of the train. Mainline set of AC rail cars, which I think intermediate powered intermediates. And a southbound goods working behind Solzer B110. Some cattle wagons as well included in that mix. And then a relatively short train, just two carriages, three, two carriages, a four wheel van and a horse box. And now this is Salon's South Signal Cabin, and we see an equivalent working um, up 
bulk cement train A11, which has probably come from the cement factory at Castle Mungert. This is Salon Station itself. And you'll see some of these scenes, you'll see the trains actually calling at Salons. I'm not too sure whether the some of the children there, they might have come from, I think, the Clongos Wood College. So I don't know whether these are special workings to do with the college. You see B170 departing Salons. And the signal you see there in the background, that used to carry a second arm for the branch line to Tullow. Our Salon station had this distinctive footbridge with you know, like portholes in it. you'll see the loop at the north end of the station. You can see an actual thing, there's a train sitting in the loop in that particular shot. An AC rail car passing Straffan. Before we move back to Clondalkin for this particular snowy scene, taking some time in winter. And now, again, we're up. This is at Sherry Orchard. So these are all fairly familiar locations to myself, but they, quite, they look quite different nowadays. And now we have a southbound train with one of the Solzer engines, the original Solzer engines, passing Hayden's Lane, just north of Lucan South Station. I suspect that might have been uh, 12.40 from Cork, uh, from Dublin to, to Cork, which was a regular Solzer diagram in the 1960s. And that's a little bit later now at Lucan South, southbound liner train followed by an upwork into Dublin behind a 121 class. And we have two A classes, A55 and a, C and a B201 class on uh, goods working. This was taken shortly before I think Straffan, uh, Luke and South signal cabin closed in 1973. A58 or train games, lots of cattle wagons on that particular working. And we have B201 class, and this B206, the first C-class engine to be re-engined. It had a distinctive wider orange band compared to the other ones. This is the old station at, Str at Straffan. Just a block post, but had been closed when this time, when this particular shot was taken. Yeah, so this is around 1973 or so. I think this is where Kisho Station is nowadays sighted. Yeah. An evening downliner train from Dublin passing Lucan with the 20 foot containers, and that's followed by another one this time, I think, at Carney's Town, south of Hazel Hatch. And a bit more modern, again, yeah, with the super train livery and up passenger working to Dublin. So that concludes the first films of Tom's I'm going to show tonight. So I hope you enjoy that. And you can see it's quite an enormous amount of um, variety included in those particular shots. It's a bit tricky sometimes to keep up with so many of them, but I hope people enjoyed them and that my commentary might have been a bit, a bit interesting. <laughs> so I'm going to show a film now from Joe St. Ledger. It's going to be along the Yaw branch. So this is going to be some workings taken in the early 1970s of beet, sugar beet trains and holiday specials. We're all familiar with Joe and uh, his 
he makes these kind of first person ever to do selfies. But that was a particular shot at um, Carrick Tuho. And now we're at Middleton and we have some beat loading going on. And here we have, I think it's 158 arriving from the yaw direction with a laden train. It's normal with these shows I include just a, a bonus film. So this is this one of Joe's is one that I've worked on quite recently. And so this is more or less the bonus film um, tonight. This is Killa and we see another beat working. And now we're in Yall with A34 or Now we have an empty B train arriving in from the Cork direction into Yall Station. At first I thought he might have overdone it there, but he kind of makes a nice recovery with the loading of the beat into the wagon. And of course, only one wagon could be loaded at a time, so I imagine it was quite labor intensive and pushing empty wagons up and taking laden ones away. And this is at Dunkettle, where Joe St. Saint, Joe Saint Ledger actually grew up and lived in the station house that you see in the background. Of course, all of the right hand side nowadays and um, the cork estuary is totally filled in because there's no trace left of Dunkettle station itself back in y'all and this time we have an a class i think it's 049 arriving with some h vans and a 20 foot container And that's uh, Mogili. And we see what farmers loading their beef. Back breaking work, I can imagine. And that's 043 passing through Middleton Station. And this is back at Killa, and we see some work being undertaken on the road bridge over the station at the Cork end. It was taken around February 1971 when this work was uh, on renewing the bridge with a concrete span. You can see Soldier Engine B106. Into core crane, I think it is. That's taking away the old beams. Of course, steam crane as it is during those days. B158 passing through with the goods to y'all. Apologies for the flickering in this particular shot. I had problems uh, digitizing this particular um, film. It doesn't last all the time though, it's just for this particular sequence. And you can see the new bridge taking shape as B124 heads through with the goods from y'all.
And now we see B130 being turned on the turntable in Yaw Station. And then passing through Killa, the bridge nearly complete at this stage. And that's the same train this time at Middleton, preparing to do some shunting. And then we're back onto the main line, and this is down at Tivoli. And we see a magnesite and oil train arriving from Cork direction. This train would have originated from the magnesite plant at Dungarvan. And this is just the entrance to North Esk, an up passenger train to Cork from Cove, and then another local train arriving into Little Island. This is a P-Way train at Cove Junction, a 14 or Some open wagons with uh, some new sleepers. This is the same train arriving into Middleton. Still at Middleton, 148. Goods from Yard again taken during the beach season. And this is Cove Junction, good strain coming off the Yaw branch. Some 20 foot containers, the usual H vans on a bull aid wagon and a PAL van. This was taken before the junction was remodeled, so it was this still a double track junction at this time in the early 1970s. This is back at Tivoli and we see two GMs propelling uh, dolomite wagons, but I don't quite think um, it's dolomite in them. I think that looks like magnesite that's in those wagons pressed into service for magnesite workings. That's why they have the uh, tarpaulin over the tops. Now these are some summer scenes, again from the all line. This is arriving into the bay platform behind the station at Yaw B132. And you'll see it's quite a mixed train. It's a Edwardian stock, a CIE Park Royal that's sandwiched uh, into uh, an AEC railcar set. You'll get a better idea when Joe films it. These were shot around summer 1969 or so. See the engine being turned on the turntable in Yaw. And we 
have B142. And then we have an A class arriving into it into the station which i think is an empty working from cork as you see it's not running into the platforms it's running into the yard and having run round it then propels the stock into the bay platform And this is just taken outside Yaw Town, between there and what's called Bog Road level crossing. And that's one of the trains you just saw heading back towards Cork. Often these workings are made up of trains, basically just the suburban local trains around Cork, but the stock just joined together. So that's why you might see the guards van marshal sometimes in the center of the train. This is a location at Bally Quirk, just west of uh, Killa. <laughs> and this is in just outside Cork Station. We're at a place called Summerhill Junction, and we see one of these trains again heading out, excursion working to Yall. And again, you can get an idea just of the sort of stock that was used on these particular summer trains. That's an empty Magnusite train passing through Tivoli, and that's Tivoli Station in the background. That had closed in the 1930s. Onto the yaw line again. Here we have two GMs with the B141 leading passing through Carrick Tool. Of course, nowadays the station at Carrick Tool, the reopened one, the platforms are on the far side of the bridge, maybe on the fork side of the bridge. I think they might have been just lo locals, but I say Joe. Joe was a very personal kind of person. He was he always willing to, to 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 film whoever came along into his shots. He didn't mind it at all. And A16 or coming off the all branch at Cove Junction again. You'll see the the guards vans, just that Dutch van, um, not quite at the end of the train. Again, it's just the local suburban stock just joined together to make up these workings. And then these are some P Way workings that Joe filmed. Um, I know some people have an interest in these particular uh, vehicles. Of course, they've long since disappeared uh, from the railway scene nowadays. Um, seldom recorded by people, uh, by railway photographers, but these are just some examples. Uh, taken um, around Little Island, where there is some re-sleepering work uh, being undertaken. Around 1974, I think this is. one of the summer excursions passing through Little Island. This is A30 or again similar train arriving into Middleton. 
crossing return working. And then we move towards the mid 1970s now. You can clearly see we're into the super train era. So the black and tan liveries are somewhat disappearing at this time. And a very lengthy train heading back with many seaside uh, day trippers from Cork who had visited y'all on that particular day. No, far ahead, yeah, just looking at something here to say. But it wasn't it wasn't always just the Edwardian stock that would turn up. Sometimes you'd actually have like the air conditioned Mark II super train. I was um I was um, um I'm very fond of really pretty fond of John. Quite, quite a contrast to the Edwardian stock that you just saw. Double O five, heading back to Cork. Middleton Station in 011. And this is a ballast train in Middleton Station. This was they used, uh, during the summer months, I think they used Middleton as a ballast loading point because Liz Duff on the Dublin Cork main line was closed, so they used a local contractor to supply the material, the stone from a quarry just outside Middleton. And you'll see that Joe travelled on this train back into Cork. See, the lorry was using normally what is used for the, the loading bank that's used for B trains. On this occasion, it's for the P way work. And so we see the train with Joe having got off. He films the train passing through the east end of Kent Station in Cork. You'll notice it's made up of the older, well, the newer four-wheel ballast wagons that it was at the time, and some older types, I think, from the Great Southern and Western Railway era. And here's Joe himself ending this particular film in y'all. So that concludes the first two films of tonight's show. And then the second half, we'll go back to Tom Dowland's films, and we'll cover some scenes from the Dublin South Eastern Line and the Midland Great Western again in the 1960s and early 1970s before ending with the North Kerry Line. So I hope you enjoyed those two films tonight and uh, we'll talk to you after the break. So the next film of Tom Dowland's is going to cover the Dublin South Eastern and the Midland Great Western, but we'll also revisit the Dublin Cork main line as well as the Dublin Belfast main line. So I'm going to go back to sharing screen now. Working on the DSE line in the 1960s. So we see an A-class heading south through Westland Road. And this is out by Williamstown, which is just between Booterstown and Black Rock an up train to the city centre.
Thanks, George. That's a southbound train. Presumably a suburban working to Dunleary or Bray. And this is the former station. I think it's Monkstown or the one at... Yeah, Monkstown station, I think it is. But uh, this is Greystones and an up working from Wicklow with B177. And now we move to the New Ross branch. And this is just outside New Ross at Ross Birkin. And this is beside the wharf along the River Barrow at Stafford's Wharf. Uh, what you're seeing here and what I think the working is, is that B107 has collected some sidings, uh, some wagons from the sidings at Stafford's and is propelling back to the station. That bridge you just saw, that's the old uh, New Ross to, War to Waterford Road, and that was replaced by that level crossing in about 1972. So here we see B107 in the yard at New Ross Station. course passenger services had ceased over the North Wexford line in 1963 but it remained in use for goods up until the mid 1970s and then occasional freight until 1995. Now we're back in Dublin and we're just leaving Westland Row behind a 121 class diesel. Now this shot is a little bit as you can, as you can see it's a bit overexposed but I've tried to darken the footage to bring back some detail. You can see Liberty Hall and um, just about but uh it's just slightly overexposed uh, the sun was quite strong that day here we are passing through tara street station still with its old uh canopies platform awnings and uh, out onto the loop line bridge of course this may have been a mainline train of course which would have been working from westland row possibly to sligo or Galway, and we're passing through Amiel Street, through what is now Platform 7 at Connolly Station. then out by North Strand Junction onto the line towards Drumcondra. And now we see the, what well, I think is the Sligo Mail Train passing the site of the old station at Glasnevin, just beyond Claude Road. You can see the TPO was behind the engine. And then we see an up mail train, again, a 121 class, passing uh, Glass Nevin Junction. And that's the Liffey branch that you can see just in the foreground. And now we move to Liffey Junction itself. And this is an evening uh, goods working behind A2. And as you'll see, it's banked in the rear by a C-class engine, which have been pushing the train or banking it up from North Wall. I think that may have been a Sligo goods train. As you'll see, it has some SO oil tanks on it. There's the C-class acting as the banker. Another evening goods train, this time A11, passing the site of Blanchard's town station, which is totally obliterated nowadays by the M50 motorway. Again, this is taken just near Blanchard Town, uh, between uh, more or less just just on one of where the slip road is for one of the M50 junctions. You can see the film. This film suffered a little bit of damage, but I've tried to clean it up as much as possible. <laughs> And 
And this is the old station at Lucan North. So we saw Lucan South earlier, but this is Lucan North. That will close in 1947, that station. And then we're back around the Blanchardstown area. I think what will be around the curve nowadays will be the M3 Parkway Station, or Navan Road Parkway Station, actually. A44, you know, with a downed goods working. You can really get the sense of variety of goods traffic with grain wagons, cattle wagons, oil tanks. Um, you'll see, of course, there's a few flat wagons with cars on them as well. Bitumen tanks. Yeah. And this is just by the Clonliffe Mill A42 along the Liffey branch. And this is another goods working, taking the curve just beyond Leak Slip Station. And I think that would have been a Sligo working, judging by the, the oil tank wagons on that train. Now we have an evening passenger train passing through Blanchardstown behind a 121 class, and probably a male working as you can see with the TPO just behind the engine. So it's either a Galway or Sligo mail train. And another goods working again all around the Blanchardstown area. And a familiar location, Clonsilla. 121 class, again another down mail train. And this is either be again B123 or 127. We can identify it by the darker shade of the buffer beam. This was a red buffer beam. For whatever reason, the train stopped, I think, to collect for the driver to collect the staff. He wasn't using the automatic snatcher. up train to Dublin. You'll see you're using the automatic snatcher on that particular occasion. Now we have an up working AEC rail car and you can clearly see the snatcher extended out. And then this is Minute, again another down mail train. And now we move to the Dublin Cork line, we were already at it that earlier, but we see an A-class and a Sulzer engine arriving into the station. These would have been all shot again around 1965, 66. And then we have that 1240 uh, Dublin Cork working with B113, pictured passing through Cherry Orchard. And also at Cherry Orchard, southbound, goes working behind an A class. And we have an up rail car from Cork. Here we have Clondalkin signal cabin. A53, a 52. Real smoky, crossy engines as they were. And a southbound train passing through Clondalkin station.
taken around before uh, 19, the end of 1966. I think by then they had replaced the semaphore signals with colour light signals. But the cabin itself, of course, would be closed in the early 70s when CTC signaling was installed. B113 again. And that cherry orchard. So this would have been more or less the nearest location to where Tom was living in Walkinstown. Of course, nowadays this is the site where the quadruple tracks uh, just merge into two. Back at Clondalkin Station. A55, that's the preserved engine in Castle Ree with a down bulk cement train. Before we move to Hazel Hatch southbound working behind a GM diesel. Where Tom shot these particular views at Hazel Hatch, that's where the loop was in later years uh, that was installed in the mid 1970s during CTC resignaling. Of course the whole scene at Hazel Hatch has changed completely with the quadruple tracks. And then we move out onto the Curra. And this is Cherryville Junction with an up train from Waterford joining the main line. And still at Cherryville Junction, southbound working from Dublin. Looks like an up mail train, probably from Cork. And then that's just a shot of an AC rail car set leaving Limerick. Uh, so we move back across the city and we go to Amien Street Station and we're going to go up the Great Northern Main Line again. We see B233, that was one of the C-Class engines that was re-engined in May 1966 with a 980 horsepower Maybach engine. And here we see that uh, tourist train, I think it is again heading back in the evening to Belfast behind a WT class tank engine. I think it was number 54. That's passing, uh, more or less approaching Harmonstown Station. And you'll see Harmonstown Station again in a second. But uh, here's uh, VS class number 207 Boeing, which we saw earlier. Yeah, climbing up the gradient through Colester and Harmonstown. That's Harmonstown Station. He was yacked a little bit by the, the rail car sitting in the station there. And then we have an AEC rail car set in the UTA uh, Brunswick Green livery heading through Rahini Station. And this is just north of Hoke Junction. And that's the footpath that led from Hoke Junction up to Baldoyle, the footpath on the left there. And you see for 207 again. Again, all very rural looking, but completely different nowadays. 
Uh, same location, this time a southbound train from Belfast with a 121 class. And a northbound AC rail car set. And this is the site of Bal Doyle Station itself, um, a very short lived station. It only existed from 1844 to 1846. Here we see from the road bridge at Bal Doyle, Belfast bound train, again a single 121 class. And we have an evening shot looking the opposite way, this time Dublin bound. And Clon Griffin Station would more, more or less be in the background of this particular shot. Southbound AEC railcar. Passing again what would be the site of Clon Griffin Station today. And we see that WT class tank engine heading north, and it's just crossing the River Main Bridge just north of Clon Griffin. Here's a similar shot, it's a little bit overexposed and again. It's worth showing the VS class engine in full flight. And this is passing a uh, good yard at uh, Grosvenor Road in Belfast. We just have a minute or two of Great Victoria Street with S class number 171, station pilot at Great Victoria Street. And shunting the stock of a train that's arrived in from Dublin. Lots of lots to preserve, number 171, Sleep Gunner at Whitehead. Um, you see, this was taken not too long after it passed back into or back up north to the UTA from CIE and um, it's very very dirty appearance but you can just make out uh, the number on the cab side Dublin bound train leaving behind B143, I think it was. That's a superb bracket semaphore signal that used to exist at Great Victoria Street. And then our, I think this is the closing shot of this particular film again. We're back at that site at Clon Griffin that, that Tom seemed to visit quite a bit. Fading light there. BS heading north to Belfast. So that concludes the second film of Tom's that we've shown tonight. And now we're going to show the last one now, which moves all the way to the south of the country, down to the North Kerry line, which ran between Limerick and Tralee, and ran through places like Newcastle West, Listowel, and we'll visit Castle Island and Phoenix as well. So our opening shot to Tom's North Kerry sequence is at Kerry's Road in Limerick and we see C class, I think C211, something bulk cement wagons and then we see an A class pulling a long goods train out of the yard at Kerry's Road. The line to the right leads to Limerick Check. That's A4. Uh, both the A4 and C211 are in the green livery. This was taken before the second line to Castle Mungret had been built. Uh, that didn't open until December 1966, so obviously these shots predate that. C211 and A4, you can see really the rubby appearance in which the Crossley engines got into. And now we have a brake van ride on the North Kerry goods 
behind a Solzer locomotive. And on this particular trip, uh, Tom Dowling was with uh, the late David Boyle. So here we see the train shunting in Rat Keel. And then in Newcastle West. Newcastle has four brake fans. <laughs> These were all shot around 1968, 1969, I think it was. And so departing Newcastle West as viewed from the brake van. The station is preserved, well preserved nowadays, but the whole area has changed. It's a housing estate. And here's where the line splits. So the line on the left leads to Limerick. But we're heading west towards Listow. Of course, this is all part now of the Great Southern Trail or the Great Southern Greenway, I think as it's called nowadays, recently renamed. And now we're passing over what I think is the N21 road as it was near Barna, but this, this whole scene has changed completely as well. It's the embankment on which you see the train travelling along, that no longer exists and the road is much, much wider nowadays. And that's the superb view, the classic view that one would get from Barna. So we enter the cutting and into the 110 yard long Barna Tunnel. And we pass through the station which closed in 1963 and is under restoration at the present time. And then Tom switched to black and white film got into I think this is Abbey Field and we crossed the goods working from Tralee which had an A class I think it's Kilmorna or Devon Road. <laughs> they look, they both look very similar, those stations. So we see B102 in Listowel Station. Crossing over the the um, what was it Abbey Field, Field River, and now we, this is uh, Killarney. We move back into colour and we see the radio train departing Killarney behind B130, complete with the flash headboard. And as you can see, this is slightly later into the super train days, the A class. Super train livery departing Killarney. And now we move to Gorton Clay Junction for the Castle Island branch. And we see A45 or 
joining the branch with the goods working from Tralee. arriving into Castle Island. It was mainly bag cement fertilizer that was handled in Castle Island. This is the goods yard at Castle Island. The old station and the station master's house is just visible to the left. But the regular passenger services on the Castle Island branch ceased in 1947, but it remained um, quite busy until the early 1970s with excursion traffic from there to Venus. I think the station site nowadays is a car park um, for the local library and only the station master's house really is the only, only thing that's left. You can see on this particular train it had the back-to-back, -back, short lived back-to-back four-wheel fertilizer wagons. They were superseded by the bogey fertilizer wagons within a couple of years of these scenes being shot. I reckon this is all around June 1973, definitely when Tom took a holiday. He used to go on regular holidays with his uh, late wife Dolores down to Kerry. And so he often just filmed and photographed whatever things were operating in the area. Then we see A21R passing the level crossing at camp just outside Castle Island. And then we see A45R. Of course, they were taken on different days, but I've just stitched the film together. In fact, I've stitched some of these films together, so you might see that uh, slight difference in continuity between the engine numbers. That's joining the main line at Gorta Clay. And now we're back at Camp Gates and we're going to see uh, this time a GMD is along the boats working to Castle Island. And then this is the same train, this time heading back towards Tralee and we'll see this train later on and um, on the section to Listo. That's the back-to-back -back fertilizer wagons empty heading back. This is Tralee station itself, A9 or arriving in from Dublin and taken before the station was heavily rebuilt and this is A22 or with a summer excursion train at Phoenix. This may well have been the Sunday's uh, 1015 Cork Tralee service, um, which was extended to Phoenix. 
uh, during the summer months. I don't think uh, they ran the following year, summer 1974. I think the excursions were replaced by buses. So here we see A22R heading back towards Tralee, leaving Phoenix. This is Ken still on the Fina branch, but passing Kilfenora. And then approaching the location where the Fina branch joined the North Kerry line proper, just outside Tralee. And now we're on board the goods train heading towards the stow. We're passing through the North Kerry Yard in Tralee over Rock Street level crossing. The line on the left is to Feenet. And the private siding on the right that serves the Ayrton Wire uh, factory. So that's the Feenet branch on the left. And then that diverges about half a mile or so outside Tralee. Passing the distance signal for Art Furt. This is Art Furt with the beach loading bank on the left. Of course, the stations lost their regular passenger services in 1963, but the goods still remained in 1974, and still Art Furt was still open for beach until the end of 1978. Here we see A45 or heading true art first itself. And this is Abby Dorney. still exists as the signal cabin also is still in situ. Oh you watch that. of a farm machinery, we continue our journey to the stove. And this is Lixnall. Lixnaw had one of those uh, distinctive oh, semaphore signals, right. du double arms, double arm semaphore signals. As you can see in Break the background. Season. 
passing the county council siding at Lixnaw. We'll see more of that later. This is Ennismore Gates. And over the Field River again, we saw that earlier in black and white. And then we're passing some P-Way work. And this is Bally Horgan Gates. And you see it has one of those double arm semaphore signals, just like the one at Lixnaw. Now we're entering this stole. Did anyone spot the dog running there? Yeah, the train, I think, just about missed it. A45 doing a bit of shunting. Of course, the Listowel and Bally Bunyan Railway that used to just exist off to the left behind the signal cabin. I was wondering whether these shots might have been taken at a time when if you know from the film show that I did at Joe St. Ledger's on the North Kerry, the bridge at Abbey Field had been knocked out. And that was, I think it was around 1973-74. So as you'll see, I don't think this train continued beyond this though, as you'll see, just headed straight back um, to Tralee. And so we're going to leave this stole. That's Ennismore Gates, which we saw earlier with the double arm semaphore signal. And we passed by those P Way men who are approaching the bridge across the river field. Steel Girder Bridge, it is. It still exists today. So 
we approach Abbey Dorney again. I'm going to show just a slight break in the sequence because we saw this train earlier. This one would be 153 at Castle Island. I'm going to show you some film of the County Council uh, tar side that existed at Lixnaw. So that's the train passing through Abbey Dorney. Here we see the siding itself. So that was opened, I think, in July 1955. Three quarters of a mile just north of Lixnaw. See B153 depositing the bitumen tank. You see the guard operating the ground frame with the Lixnaw Abbey Dorney uh, staff. The siding was still in use right until the very end when the list all goods ceased in 1977. You notice how the driver, I think he drops a newspaper there for the gatekeeper. And so we commence our final journey of tonight and we head back towards Tralee. Exchanging staffs. And that's the Ore 557 road from Abbey Dorney to Art First. And you'll notice it's just off to the right, you'll see one of the traveling uh, travelers' uh, caravans on the road, which you don't really see anymore, they sort of disappeared. Um, about 20 years ago. Passing the distance signal for the gates at Ardford. This location, I think, is near the um, Valley Row Heights Hotel. The line starts to swing south towards Tralee. And now we have the Fina branch, which we saw earlier, converging from the right. And we have the distance signals. You'll notice that the distance signals are positioned just slightly different dis points. We slow for the level crossing at Rock Street. And we see that the private siding on the left serving the earthenware factory. And so over the level crossing, Rock Street and into exchanging staffs and into the North Kerry Yard. And so that brings the end of tonight's film show. So I hope you all enjoyed those films. The first one's the Toms that have been aired by the society and I want to express a great gratitude to the family of the late Tom Dial and in particular his nephew Austin who without their kind donation of his photographs and films we wouldn't be having this particular show here tonight so um, I really really appreciate the, the thanks that they showed towards myself and Colin O'Callaghan when we went round to collect the material that has enabled this footage to be digitized, edited, and shown to the wider membership. And as a point in that, I don't think Tom um, 
had ever played those films in a long, long time. But I don't think he would have expected to, to be playing them to an audience of what, over 300 that we've had here tonight. So thanks again to everyone who's come tonight and for the kind comments that you posted in the comments chat, in the chat box. So I'll hand it over back to you, George and Michael. Right, thank you very much, Kieran. That was um, absolutely superb. And if I could just start my video, I could reappear. Um, yeah, it's, uh, well, what can I say? Um, in the normal way, we ask people to applaud and um, generally show their enthusiasm. But I think the chat boxes, which are flying up at a fantastic rate, um, show um, that the how strongly fe people feel about the good work you've done, particularly, and also um, the generosity of, the, of Tom's family in making this stuff available. It's a, it's a real journey through nostalgia, as um, at least one comment uh, has put forward already. Um, we haven't really any facility to applaud, but actually at the bottom of your screen, there is a thing where you can raise your hand and put a thumbs up. So, uh, I think maybe that <laughs> so we put yes, the thumbs up coming and hands up and everything. I think the screen is filling rapidly. Okay, I think we're we're kind of coming to the end of it. There's, there's still comments flowing in, but um, it is running up to ten o'clock almost, and uh, it's been a fairly long evening for you in particular, Kieran. So again, let me thank you for all you've done um, and for putting on this lovely show. And I'll also say thanks to Paul Doyle for manfully um, looking after the waiting room tonight with, with 300 coming in. That's about one every seven or eight seconds for half an hour. And uh, so you all got in and most of you managed to stay in. So I hope you all enjoyed it. And um, we will see you all again at um, the next meetings in April. Well, th thanks again, Michael and okay. Paul and everyone involved in the background work. With us. So I'll, um, I'll close the meeting from this end and it'll be a kind of an automatic discharge like mailbags being dropped from a post office. <laughs> okay, thanks all for coming and good night.